I, I, this is fascinating. If anybody has any questions, I can start collecting them also and ask okay. Layla when she Layla. comes back. Back. I have a question. Yeah. This is Karen. Yeah. Um, my grandson is in seventh grade, and he does. He draws a cartoon for his school newspaper, school middle Ooh. school newspaper. Ooh. And I wondered if she had any advice for him on maybe a future career in cartooning. It should he study fine art, or you know, how should he develop his skills? I love that. I love yes, that. I yeah. I know. I was going to ask what no, ages she teaches. What ages she teaches? Uh, is she using color uh, pencils or uh, or watercolor? Coming night. Yes, those are all. Yeah, I'd love to see. I think she was about to show us like the progress of how she does that. Um, you know, like what what are the different stages? What are her materials? I have a question. Uh, if you can ask, or I can also ask directly. Like um, uh, I was working long back. I was working for a publication. And when we are creating a story, you know, many characters we repeat and the background and, uh, you know, the atmosphere and everything. So each and for each and every page, each and every slide, uh, she's drawing everything again, all over again, like duplicate the drawing or she created a digital thing. You know, sometimes, you know, we crop the character, we make the you know, collage on like, you know, digitally, like, so, because digitally everything is possible, right? So I used to do that way. So I just want to know how she was doing, like she's doing, because colors wise, uh, hairstyle, the character are repeated, you know, and if there are like 20 pages, we have, she has to paint and make 20 character, like in the same way and keep, like keep doing the same detail, right? So I want to know how she was doing, like she's doing, like that's my question. No, oh, that, uh, that's a great question. Yes, and how does she keep like the consistency? Consistency okay. and like the hard work also, the efforts and how much time for each and every drawing. So it's really lots of work, right? It just um, sounds like a lot of work. And not to mention how to come up with the storyline, especially if you're doing one daily. Yeah. <laughs> That's true talent. Yes. Endless yes. creativity. Yeah. So whether she's help is taking help from the digital software. Hi, and... I'm sorry that I'm sorry that happened. Um, no. I'm sorry worries. that I had to drop out of there. But um, you were talking about coming up with a. Um... Oh wait. Oh, we have so many questions for you. We we're just discussing all yeah. of them. Let me just let me just open my. PowerPoint again. Okay. Okay. Did you have a question that you wanted we, to ask? We have a lot of generalized questions. Okay. Um, I think you were Go about ahead. to get into, we're really interested, especially as artists, what your process is in terms of creating the cartoons and the materials you're using. We're, we're very material focused here. Oh yeah. Well, I, yeah, I, um, the ones, now when I do the cartoons, I do them in pen and ink with my, you know, Crowquill pen and then scan them into my computer and color them in Photoshop. Um, generally, when I do these illustrations, like the one that I'm showing you now, I, um, you know, I showed you that very rough drawing and then I put a sheet of tracing, I tape a sheet of tracing paper over it and, sort of refine it a little bit each time. Like this is sort of my second or third drawing. And then... Um, and how do you keep like for a daily column or monthly, how do you keep the consistency going? Oh yeah. Of well, your character space. And yeah, that's something that I just think over time, you know, you, you draw these characters over and over again and you just get used to it, you know, but you can always, for example, when I've done animation, I create a model sheet of each character um, looking um, straight at you, sideways, you know, just in different poses and so forth. And so that helps me keep the consistency. You know? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, That's what I was thinking, you know, I was, uh, I was doing the same way, but I didn't do much. So I was just 
very curious about how is your process, you know, because keeping yeah. all the character consistent, the color wise, the stroke wise. So that's a, really a good to know, like the doing in a Photoshop or any other software, Adobe. Yeah. Or something. Right. So, really nice. so yeah. how were you, how were you trained? Did you go to art school? Um, well, when a undergraduate, I went to Bard College in upstate New York and I majored in English because I like to write, but I did take a lot of studio art classes. And then for graduate school, I got a master's in illustration from Syracuse University. Yeah, so. um, and then, um, okay, so, so that's my final rough. And then what I do is I trace it onto either Bristol board or Arsh watercolor paper. And, oh, I'm not showing you this full screen. That's the problem here. Let me just, uh, okay, wait, it's, sorry about all these ah, technical glitches here. We just get to see more of your lovely work. Okay, here we are. Okay, so that was my final sketch. And I, I put it on a light box, you know, um, with my Bristol board or Arsh watercolor paper on top. And I trace and I ink over it. And then I use watercolors to color. So I don't always color things in Photoshop. You know, I, I like to use watercolors a lot. <laughs> this is a horrible reproduction. I mean, it's just not the greatest paper you know, but you can see how the colors really don't look as bright as in the final artwork, but that, that always happens. So, um, so at one point, uh, a couple of years after I had to end Miss Sotheby, I started teaching cartooning at Glen Echo Park uh, to kids. And I really, really enjoyed teaching. I, I, taught a lot of classes at Glen Echo um, in lots of after school programs. And then eventually I started doing visiting artist residencies in elementary and middle and high schools. And in both in cartooning and animation, I bought some animation equipment. And so my students were able to film their work and, to, and they even created the musical soundtracks uh, for their films and performed them. So, um, so it's been really wonderful to see all the work they've done. And this is, was a really special project that we did. It was an after school project at Loiterman Middle School and Wheaton High School, where I asked the students to uh, come up with some quotes about books or about reading and illustrate them. So each student created a bookmark and then we had the bookmarks printed and distributed to all the libraries in Montgomery County. And they're bilingual. They were in different languages, Spanish and English, Hindi and English, Tagalog and English, you know, so it was really a nice, we called it the Multicultural Bookmarks Project. And for this project and for my residencies, I generally get grant funding. So I write a lot of uh, grant proposals <laughs> and um, mainly from the Arts and Humanities Council of Montgomery County and also from the Maryland State Arts Council. And you know what? The Montgomery Art Association gave me some money for this project too, so yeah. And then um, just to, to for practice, I've, I've gone for quite a few years to um, the open studio sessions, the life drawing sessions at Montgomery College in Rockville. Uh, I think it's just a really important thing to do to keep drawing from life. And um, I also like to draw the people in the class. And then um, at one point I became aware of, uh, I guess you all know the Urban Sketchers, Urban Sketchers website, um, people around the world who just draw their neighborhoods or their cities or you know urban scenes and so I started going downtown 
um, to different neighborhoods, DuPont Circle, Capitol Hill, Georgetown, um, because I love the, the old architecture, the 19th century architecture there, all those details. And uh, I take a lightweight stool with me and um, one of these arch blocks, you know, those pads that are like where that have all the paper uh, glued together so it makes a nice firm block. And I do the drawing in pencil and then go over it in ink and then color it with watercolor. Um, and I do the whole thing on site. So it's it's a lot of fun and it's it's really nice to have feel that kind of focus and intensity <laughs> when you're out there drawing. Um, feeling, you know, I want to get it all done in one sitting. So I, I just like that. It's, and, and also, um, it really helps me. Uh, I have problems with perspective, for example, and it really helps me to draw <laughs> architecture. It's, it's a good practice for me. Um, so if you see, this is Logan Circle. You see this gray house over here with the green roof? Um, that is the home of Theral Smith. Theral Smith, um, it, it, she, that's her right there on the steps there. Um, she taught ballet in DC for many, many years. And she's been living in this house in Logan Circle for over 80 years. She was so nice to pose for me. And this was a few days before her 101st birthday. Yes. and. Uh, <laughs> And um, I was intrigued by her house because I, I, it's probably kind of hard to see this, but right above the door there, it says Dr. T.C. Smith. Um, her father was a doctor and he had his medical practice there in the basement of that house. And, um, and then I found out about her and I was drawing the neighborhood and I showed her my sketch and I said, would you pose for me one day? And she was really nice and she took the time to pose for me. And as you see, she, she has those Halloween decorations there. She decorates her windows according to the season. Um, so that is something that I would like to do in the future is not only draw these houses, but have people pose for me, you know, the people who live there. And this is an accordion sketchbook uh, where I just uh, focused on doors and windows in DC, different neighborhoods. And then, there are a lot of really interesting and unique roofs also in DC. So this is another accordion sketchbook, just all roofs, but it's a portion of it. It's very long actually. And this is um, Blaine Mansion, the roof of Blaine Mansion, which is in DuPont Circle. And this is the roof of the Embassy of Cameroon near DuPont Circle. And I also like to draw these um, antique or classic cars. And uh, once a year, uh, they, there's a big show, I guess you probably know about it. There's a big show of antique and classic cars at the Rockville Civic Center with just a tremendous number of cars. And unfortunately it's only like three hours long. So, <laughs> you know, I, I wanna draw every car there, but I, I just have a limited amount of time to draw, but I, I just find it fun to draw these cars. And if you have any questions after this presentation, I just wanted to give you um, my email. Also because just wanted to let you know that I received a grant recently from the Arts and Humanities Council to teach some virtual cartooning classes for seniors. That's people who are age 50 and above. Um, and these will be starting on May 4th. It's, it's a five week course and you watch my instructional video on YouTube and then we have a meeting on Zoom where you know, we all work together each week and the classes are free and the supplies are free. You pick them up at the Wheaton Library. So if anybody's interested or you know anyone who's interested, just send me an email and I'll let you know when the registration is open. And I'm also doing graphic novel creation classes for kids that will be virtual as well. And again, it's this, uh, these will be starting in late April, April 22nd, but it's the same kind of thing where you watch an instructional video and then we have uh, a Zoom meeting. Um, now, I wanted to show you one more thing if I can get to it here. 
it's just a little clip from from a film that I'm working on now. It's an animated film called Walk. And I just have a clip that I wanted to show you here. If we can, let me see. Let's see if I can. Here we go. Can you all see that? Yeah. Okay, so, so this film that I'm working on is kind of a gallery of different characters, each one walking in a way that gets across their personality. And it's, a, it's really a classic uh, um, exercise for animators to create a walk cycle in which you show a, a character really coming to life through the way that they walk. So my, my film doesn't have a storyline. It's, it's like a gallery of different characters, you know, walking and maybe bumping into each other and so forth. So that, of course it'll have sound and, and sound effects and music and so forth. No, no dialogue or anything. But. What are you using to create that? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually drawing, making my drawings, uh, scanning them into Photoshop, adding a little bit of a color here and there, very little color. Um, and then my sister, who's a videographer, is going to edit it all on um, Final Cut Pro. But I mean, it's it's really just a series of drawings. It's like a flip book. I mean, you know, it's a series of drawings, each one a little bit different from the next, which I just create by hand and then scan into Photoshop. Oh, wow. It sounds very, like very labor intensive. It is very labor intensive. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah. That's old school. It's old school, but, you know, I think that's the way I prefer to work. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's the way that my students are working, too. They create flip books and um, cut paper animations, and we do it traditionally. I think that's the best way to learn. I, I learned to the animator, those, those bits, long back. It's like a way ago where Windows was not there. And I learned multimedia and graphics and everything. So 2D yeah. animator, it was really a laborious job. I was so much like, uh, it, was, it was so fun, but still at the same time, when you make a two minutes video, my God, like lots of sketch. And then I was <laughs> like, and I switched to the 3D animation because it was then easier for me because... 3D animation, for 3D animation, we can use the direct 3D studio. Mm -hmm. That was quite easy for me. But yeah, I appreciate it. It's so fun. And I'm now I can, I'm being nostalgic because looking at your clip, it was so fun. I was just drawing and uh, doing that same thing, you know, and converting to the 3D, 2D animator, like the animator pro, actually, I was using. Uh -huh. I don't know whether you heard about it, Animator Pro. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, I guess, you know, I just see animation as an extension of drawing for myself, you know, the, the love I have for drawing. Um, so that's why I don't depend that much on, on software or just mm -hmm. limit, I want to limit my use of software. And also there are ways you can save up on labor when you're doing animation. For example, these walks that I do are cycles. So I might just do 12 drawings and repeat them over and over again. You know, for example, that, that walk that I just showed you, um, it was a cycle, it was a repetitive, yeah. you know, so, you know, there are ways to, to save on, on time. Like I used to do with the glass copy, doing a glass copy, I don't know what you call it but with the bulb and the glass and the copy, you know, so we just put the one pressing or the drawing and we extend the leg movement. And then again, we extend the leg movement. So that way we can create the body will be same, but mm -hmm. with the glass copy, I don't know, we, yeah. we will have, we used to have a tub kind of thing, a box. And yeah, like a, a light box, a light box. Yeah, a light box, yes, light box, yeah. yes, light box. Yeah, I use a light box. But yeah. we just, you, so... Yeah, so it was fun. Yeah, so yeah. beautiful, beautiful work you have done. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> do you work from front to back, back to front, a little bit of both when you're illustrating? How do you, how do you do that? What do you mean front to back or back to front? Well, I guess you know when you're working pen and ink, um, you, you uh, things that are forward, in things that would be in front, uh, and then the background in, information. 
So with lines that wouldn't necessarily, you don't want to completely intersect and, and ruin something that's in the foreground, are you working from the stuff that's in the front and then going back so that your lines don't intersect? Gee, I haven't really thought about that. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, <laughs> it's not something that's, that's come to my mind when I've been drawing. I don't know. Because you're just so good. It just comes naturally. Well, no, <laughs> it's just the way that you're looking at it. I don't know. It's the way you approach it, you know? Um, I mean, for example, if I were doing a watercolor, I would probably do a wash for the background to begin with, you know? And then, so I guess I would be working from the background to the front. Mm -hmm. yeah. Lilo, you said that you did that one series that you showed us in PowerPoint of starting in pencil and then yeah. bringing it more and more, uh, getting it more and more firm. Right. Um, so I guess uh, that, that method kind of eradicates the what happens first. Yeah, I mean, um, well, first of all, usually like for a published illustration, I'm given the, you know, like the, the size, you know, the, the height and width that is going to be um, in its final form. And so I have to take that into account. And I always work larger, you know, than the final uh, reproduction. Um, and then I, I always like to start very, very rough um, just to get a sense of how to, uh, the composition, you know, how to work out the composition before I do anything else, before I get into the details. So yeah, I just like to start very rough and loose and then uh, just flesh out the, the drawing and, and add detail and, and refine it a little. But you know, the, you know what the funny thing is? When I go downtown and I'm sketching on site, um, I'm, I feel a lot freer than when I'm doing an illustration where I'm doing these layers of, uh, of tracing paper because when I'm working on site, I just have one piece of paper and I'm doing everything on that piece of paper, the pencil rough and the ink and the color. And it's a very freeing experience because I think that this whole thing about going from roughs to finish it stage by stage, you know, on different sheets of paper can sometimes take away the spontaneity of that initial drawing. It, it, it becomes kind of lifeless as you keep polishing it. Do you know what I mean? You know, Definitely. I, uh, we have a question in the chat of how much larger do you work than the final reproduction? Um, hmm, like um, maybe, 130% something, it, it really depends, you know, um, sometimes even twice the size. Um, so yeah, just on whatever size I'm comfortable with depending on the, the final size, yeah. I think you end up answering that question I had because you're, you're working from pencil through the, and working it out until you get to the point where you ink, you're not inking anything from start to finish. That's right, I'm not inking, I'm not inking from the start. Right, okay. that's right. I always work in pencil first, no matter what I do, it's always in pencil first. Okay, that, yeah. answers, the, that, okay. that answers the question. Okay, that's good, <laughs> that's good, I'm glad. Um, so. Um, I, so I have another question in terms of, I mean, just creating these storylines. Yeah. How do you come up with the inspiration? Yeah, well, it's funny because when I was doing the daily comic strip, I couldn't wait for inspiration. I had to be um, more disciplined about, you know, finding ideas. So one thing I did was I kept a little notebook. I have a whole series of little notebooks, which, you know, I just jotted things down, just things I overheard people say, things I heard on the radio, like I listen to NPR a lot, you know, um, things I might read in the paper. And a lot of these were sort of like half-baked ideas. I didn't know how I was going to use them, but I felt that it was material that I could, might be able to work into a cartoon eventually. So that was one thing I did. And I still do that. I still keep a notebook. And um, another thing I did at the time was 
I kept like newspaper articles about topics that I might cover in the strip, like, you know, this whole gardening craze that was going on and things about health food since they had a health food um, restaurant. And um, so it's, you know, I think it's really so helpful to keep a, a little sketchbook or, or a little notebook because even just to write down these little half-baked ideas or thoughts, you can go back to it later and make something out of it. So, so it's, yeah. And, and also I have to say that the characters' personalities, as the characters' personalities evolved, they gave me ideas for storylines because each character had a different personality. And so they kind of bounced off each other and, and that led to storylines. Yeah. And did you work like one day in advance or do you have like oh, a no. week in advance? Yeah, no, the dailies were six weeks in advance. And oh, the wow. Sundays, yeah, and the Sundays were nine weeks in advance. Yeah, because the Sundays were in color. So there was more of a printing process that they had to go through. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, um, but there was actually a question earlier when you were um, rebooting. Yeah. Um, I don't know who it was somebody's grandson is a cartoonist for the middle his middle school yeah uh, newspaper and wondering if you have any advice and how, how what would you recommend for somebody who wants to go into cartooning yeah take my class <laughs> um well yeah you know um I think it's good to take classes but I think it's great that he's doing work for his middle school paper because when I was in high school that's when I started doing cartoons. I mean, I had always been drawing as a kid, but that's when I started doing cartoons um, that were published, printed in the paper, and I could see what they looked like in print. And that's so important to, to get your work um, printed and see how it looks and you know get people's reactions to it and so forth. So um, I think it's really good that he's doing that. And also it's just the discipline of maybe uh, illustrating the, the issues that come up in his school and um, finding different subject matters to, to illustrate. But um, yeah, there's nothing like getting your work published and, and seeing what it looks like in print. And, and going forward in yeah. terms of, I mean, do you go to art school? Like what is the typical career now? Yeah, I, you know, I don't really know what the typical career is. I mean, when I was um, consider when I was thinking about what kind of college I was going to go to, I considered art school, but I ended up going to a liberal arts college because I wanted to get a broader education. And there were other subjects I liked. I liked to write. Um, I wanted to continue studying French that I had been studying, you know, up to high school. I liked history, and um, so I think it is good to to learn a lot of different subjects. And, um, and then I specialized when I went into grad school because that's when I, I, um, I majored in illustration. But I also had taken a lot of classes just on my own between college and um, graduate school. Like I, I worked for a little while in an animation studio and um, took some graphic design classes and things like that. Um, so, so it's good to learn a lot of different things. <laughs> I don't think it's, you know, I think it really is important to get a well-rounded education because you want, if you are a cartoonist, you have to develop a point of view and you have to be something of a generalist and, and uh, know different subjects, yeah. That's really good advice. Um really good advice. Uh, does anybody else have, I feel like I'm asking all the questions. Anybody <laughs> else have any questions? It's so fascinating. Just a different, uh, you know, creative, I mean, clearly you're very creative and brilliant. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, anybody else have any questions for Layla? I don't have a specific question. I kind of had a thought to follow up what she just said. Um, I'm not sure, Layla, Layla. Layla, yeah, Layla. Layla, I beg your pardon. Um, if it, if your education was sort of pre-personal um, computer, 
and so you naturally had the actual hands-on drafting yeah. going on. But even so, now that kids are, you know, basically the industry, if we're going into the industry, it's all these programs, but it still is an excellent skill, you know, just to have in your toolbox to know how to do these things by hand, I think. Well, and also, you know, what I found in the workshops that I teach and the classes that I teach to kids is that kids really love to draw on paper. I mean, for example, one of the animation workshops I do, um, they make thaumatropes, you know, those discs that you spin, there's like maybe a cage on one side and a bird on the other. And when you spin it, it looks like the birds in the cage that's called a thaumatrope. It's a very early optical toy. They just love making this stuff. We use these old optical toys and the zoetrope, which is that drum that has slits all around and you put a strip um, of drawings inside and spin it and it looks like the drawings have come to life. You know, it looks like they're animated. Kids love this stuff. You would think that being on the computer so much has just turned them off on these uh, almost primitive, <laughs> um, you know, optical instruments, but, but no, they, they really like it. And I think it's a really good way to introduce them to things that they might eventually end up doing on the computer. Um, but, you know, I think there's, there's still a lot of interest in what we see as traditional or old fashioned methods that are pre-computer. Kind of peels the onion away from the mystery or whatever I'm trying to say. That's exactly, that's true. That's true because I think it, it gives them a much better understanding of how animation works. Yeah. Yeah, because it's very simple and, and basic, yeah. So, um, there's another question in the chat. How did you overcome your issues with perspective? Oh, I haven't. <laughs> I mean, that's just, um, that's just something I'm learning all the time, you know? And that's why I think it helps me to go downtown to draw these buildings, because that's, that's a big challenge when you're drawing architecture, yeah. So what are you, uh, this is my question. Yes. Um, I, you said you were working on this animation. Yes. What, what else do you have going on? Like how many projects do you have going on at a given time and what are you working on currently? Yeah, well, currently I mentioned that I'm working on redesign. Well, not redesigning, but sort of revamping my, my website and I have a bunch of new material to add to it. And then, um, I'm also working on this film, which is a big project. And uh, then I've got all these classes coming up too. And um, I'm creating videos for them since they're virtual now. Um, and, and I just like to keep up my sketching too, even though of course I haven't been able to go to life drawing or to go down. I, I usually take the Metro downtown and I've avoided doing that this year. So I really miss that. Um, but usually I have maybe th at least three projects going on at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I'm also trying to do some new um, one panel cartoons. And do you typically in create them and then pitch them to publications or do publications come to you and say, this is what we need? Well, I would say both. Yeah, yeah, you have to do both. You can't wait for people to <laughs> get to you. Yeah, somebody said, oh, so to everyone favorite cartoonist, Raymond Finkelman said to everyone favorite cartoonist, I have a lot of favorite cartoonists. One of my favorite cartoonists is, is Ed Corin. Oh, and Jules Pfeiffer, you know, um, do you know Claire Bretichet, anybody? She's a French cartoonist. She was, she passed away um, recently, but she's very similar to Jules Pfeiffer because they both um, have these, you know, cartoons that have to do with people's relationships to each other, dialogues between people. And that's something that really inspired me in my cartoons. So if I want, I want to start illustrating children's books. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and I went to art school and et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm, I'm retired. 
So I, I want to start getting into this. And how do I get started? What it, 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 once I pull my portfolio together, what what do I do? Who do I send it to? Well, I have to tell you that the children's book industry is a really tough one to get into, especially now, uh, because children's book publishers used to be independent and um, you, they were much more approachable at one time, but now they're like huge corporate entities. They're very hard to get in, you know, to, it's very hard to make a connection with, with the editors and, and, um, and art directors and children's book publishers, but there is an organization and darn it, now it escapes me. It's a, I think it's called a children's um, book writers and illustrators. You know what? If, if you can send me an email, I'll find out and I'll send it to you because it, it's just not off the top of my head. There's, it's an organization of people who want to get into the children's book industry and they have meetings and they offer advice. And I think that that's probably the best way to, to learn about this, you know, but it is a tough industry to break into. So I don't know if anyone else has yeah, does anybody else have any questions? I know we're almost at eight o'clock. Um, this was fascinating. This was fascinating. I, I, I have one, one more question, one last sure. question about Please. the classes for children. Please. Are they yes. are they listed on your website? Yes. Is that where I would go? They're they're see? not listed on my they're not listed on my on my website, but on my website. Um, yeah. if um, you send me an email, send me an I'll, email. Send you an email I'll back and tell you which upcoming classes I have for kids. I have for kids. Okay. How okay. young? Okay. How young? Oh, 10, 10, oh, years, 10, 10 years. 10 years old is a young. 10 years old is a young. Youngest. Yeah, young. that's fine. It, yeah, this is my grandson I was talking about earlier. Okay, great. He's, well, okay, great. he's almost 13. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So, um, Yes, somebody said society of, I'm getting an echo somehow, but somebody said society of children's book writers and illustrators for Nancy. It's in the chat there, society of children's book writers and illustrators. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, Bali. You were clearly, clearly on it. That's great. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Last questions? No. Layla, this was fascinating. Your oh, work you. is amazing. The oh. constant turnaround and talent that you have to keep doing this and co coming up with storylines, like I, I am in awe. Oh, that's so nice. So, thank you. I guess. And um, I, from all of us at MAA, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. and. You know, thanks for, you know, everybody for coming and it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes. It was great. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right. So Jenna, I hope I'll be seeing you around the neighborhood. Then. I know. I know. I'll see you all the time now. <laughs> yeah, that's great. We'll have to get together. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. It was so exciting. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Good night, it. everybody. Stay safe and enjoy yeah. the nice weather. Yeah. Yes. Stay well, safe from what? Stay safe. Right from what? Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye. Good night. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye. Good job, Jen. To you, if you can okay. stay for a while. Yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm talking to Jen. If yeah, yeah. It's no, all it's... fine. I want to talk to you. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Thank, bye. You. Thank you. Yeah, Jen. Uh, you know, uh, I was uh, waiting for Laurie's uh, reply. And oh, yeah. Before yesterday, I already emailed her. But there is no response. I don't know. I wonder. I hope something is good with her. Yes. And whether she's interested or not i don't know anything what to do now when was the last time you heard from her um i can tell the email and i think i forwarded that long back it's been a while it was like over a week right more than that yes more than that let me let me tell you the but day before yesterday i emailed her 
Uh, oh, you did. You so you yeah, did. Yeah, I, okay. I I did, and okay. I asked her uh, if she can send me the brief bio, headshot, and uh, confirmation, right? But I never heard about uh, from her. So, what to do now? You know, usually, it does take a little bit of time for people to respond with their like when they have to collect information and send it. Mm -hmm. We just want to guarantee, or. I, I would give it a couple more days and maybe say, hey, we just want to make sure like to confirm. Perfect. Yeah. And I'm we'd like to send, we'd like to start publicizing your event to get more people. Like, so, you know, it's on her. I think uh -huh. just put it that way, but maybe we'll give it to uh, till Friday and then maybe have to come up with somebody else. So do you want me to email her again? If you I did it the not. day and a half ago, I feel like if you did it a day and a half ago, that's wait. And, and should we and give her one more shot on Friday? Yeah. And, and, and then you know, if she doesn't reply, right, Corin? Like if she doesn't reply and we go ahead and find somebody else. And then after a week or 10 days again, she come back. No, I confirmed. So I don't know what to do. I, I'm, I don't want okay. this kind let's, of complication, you know? Let's see. That, I know, I know. That's come up with, which is so funny because we usually people are just like, yeah, this is fantastic. And um, how about you email her one more time on Friday morning? Correct. Yeah. And if we don't hear anything, and, and like strongly word it being like we need you like make sure you're committed if not we need to find somebody else for this time slot basically um oh, by the way can you stop the recording please oh yeah sorry <laughs> oh